Let me just a few words about Greg. Um, Greg is a great guy. So uh, he, <laughs> depends on who you ask. He's uh, an, an expert furniture conservator and uh, an expert horologist. He has uh, quite an extensive background in furniture repair, uh, fr antique furniture restoration, and has done a number of items here in a number of our antiques here in the, in the meeting house. Um, he is an expert horologist, has had extensive training, I guess all over the world, right? Yes. yes. Um, and um, his uh, uh, place of business is in Alloway, New Jersey. Uh, he gave a talk <coughs> last September on American Empire style furniture, which was really excellent. So we're really lucky to have Greg back and I think you'll really enjoy his presentation. So without further ado. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, again, there's, there's more people here than the Historical Society is 10 times this size. So, um, and uh, we had some handouts. If that, no one got one at the end, we'll have them in the back or a card, uh, whatever you need. We're going to talk about fundamentals of uh, horology or clocks or time today. And then keep it fairly loose. Anybody has any questions, let's do it as we go. I think it's going to be easier than at the end. First, you guys here, the society has two, two tall case clocks. Uh, we have a cherry one here and a walnut one over here. Uh, both were having a little bit of issues, so I've had the one mechanism for this one for a few months. And uh, we're gonna take a look at it today, put it back in, maybe just talk about this clock a little bit, uh, different components, how the clock developed. Jump over to the, uh, the video here, uh, going back, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Uh, I'm. I was engaged in doing a, uh, a restoration of, quote, America's oldest town clock, which is in Salem, New Jersey. And the clock actually dates back to somewhere around 1702. And it's the same bell from 1702 is still on that clock. Yeah. Four movements down from that, and I'll explain some of that. Um, that's not, this is not continuing. It kind of got off the ground, and then some absconded with the funds to do the restoration, and of course we're just mm -hmm. at a holding pattern right Where now. Where is that? Salem, New Jersey. Salem. Salem City or Salem? Salem City. Okay. And then we have a, a quick PowerPoint at the end to try and engage everyone with the, how timekeeping started from sundials uh, right up until the present day type clocks we run today, GPS and things like that. So, uh, and uh, just to add to the Napoleon factor, we may have mentioned last time, I worked on a clock from, uh, from Napoleon and Josephine. It came from the Chateau de Versailles in Paris, oh, about two, three years ago. And it came in about 36, uh, 30, I, didn't, I didn't plan on showing that today. I have nothing here to show that. Um, 36 cases. And uh, it weighs about 850 pounds, stands about eight feet high, two huge hair, cherubs flanked by a center regulator <laughs> and built specifically for, uh, for him and them by the Dutouche family, which was the largest, uh, most renowned family in uh, clockmakers in France for the last 300 years. And so a great honor. And this has been in storage for around 80 or 90 years in Versailles. So it was bequested from somebody from uh, in France to somebody here, and they didn't want to keep it. So what I was to do was to put it back together, do the restoration and conservation, and we sent it to auction at Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. So this has been sitting in the basement of Versailles and all these cases and wooden cases and boxes. And it was totally bronzed array, totally mercury gilded, had to be very sympathetically cleaned and, and get, getting it running. And then the drive was a trip. So you have an 850 pound clock to get into my little van to get up to Sotheby's. That was a trick in itself. Um, and it did sell and it sold for a little under 2 million. It sold for 1.9 million. Wow. And that was without commission. Was sold unfortunately to somebody in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the fellow's pals who cut the uh, Gachobi's head off, and he, that's where that's where it went. Unfortunately, wow. so unfortunately nobody went in, in France for the back. It would have been a great thing. But anyway, so you have to pay the price to. I mean, if France wanted it back, they yeah. Well, I mean, any, no. I mean, anybody in France could have bought it. Sure, sure. sure. <coughs> But as, as you know, to change around museums is very costly to change anything on the museum floor. I mean, it even takes time in this little museum to change something around. So a vignette at the Philadelphia Museum of Art or a winter tour, it costs millions and millions. And all these 
hierarchy of people <clears throat> stating their opinion of what they think should go in that corner now, you know, mm -hmm. pulling stuff out of, uh, someone said earlier that, you know, uh, we were talking about donation of clocks and stuff to museums, and I tell everybody don't do it because it's, a lot of it's very corrupt. Um, you know, something like uh, the Museum of the Art in, in, uh, in New York, the Metropolitan, I mean, that's run by a few people, a few big families. They have a lot of events off time there we don't know about, and things like that. So it, it's it's not that, um, and they don't even tell you, I mean, it's free to go in there, but they have a, what, a 25 or $40 mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. sticker. They don't tell you that. So they, they mm -hmm. want to they want to kind of screw you around by making you pay. And, mm -hmm. Oh, it's really, it's free to go in, okay. But unfortunately, they have storage after storage facility of stuff, clocks, furniture, artifacts of all kinds. And they're paying a lot of money to maintain this stuff. They don't want any of your stuff. So give it to a small historical society that can cherish it and put it out and people can see it. I think that's what I'd recommend to everybody. And I work with the National Watch and Clock Museum now for about 18, 20 years, and the same thing. Mrs. Jones wants to donate her 500 pocket watches from her husband, and she expects them to be over there next week. They'll never be there. I don't care how good they are, because the cost, again, to change display cases, it'll never happen. So they get put, and thrown in boxes, and go to a storage facility 30, 40, 50 miles away. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to just talk briefly about uh, this clock, you know, probably the third, between, I would say, the first quarter of the 19th century. And we can tell. So, uh, and we'll get a little of this in the, in the slideshow, but we have to remember the clock movements, the clock movement that was in these things started out as a movement that was hung in a bracket. So just a bracket on the wall, you have a pendulum. First they didn't start with a pendulum, they just had they just had one or two weights. And then they gained a second pendulum as it became a striking clock. And remember the beginning. Second weight, right? The, the second, second weight, pendulum. yeah. The second weight. So second weight. And remember the beginning clocks would run in towers. The church across the street, or this clock we're going to talk about here. And it was just a visual thing. Or, I'm sorry, in the beginning it was just a bell. So there was no, there was no classic uh, glass dials or anything like that. So people would wake up, so oh, it's time we gotta wake up, we got 10 minutes to go to work in Salem, New Jersey, or we're gonna go to school, or, and they had all these different set times that the, the bells were gonna ring for society. So it was a, something to keep the community together. And it was, everyone was riveted around that, uh, around that clock. Uh, then you got in the mid 18th century and clocks gained bells, so, so you had, Bells, I'm sorry, they gained the dials now. So we had bells, now we can see it's a visual thing. And pre-1700, no one had the conception of what a minute hand was, let alone a second hand was. So uh, you'll see pre-1700 clocks with only one hand, and that's the hour hand. So no one had, you know, who has to be anywhere in minutes? Even hours was a stretch sometimes. <laughs> you know, maybe it was day and, day and night, one of those. So we started out with a clock on the wall, just a mechanism hanging on the wall. And uh, we started getting into problems because in the beginning, around 1700, 1650, when these things were hanging on the wall, there was a couple problems. This was our house, we had just two rooms. And we had a fireplace going all the time. It was, if it wasn't, it was in the summer, it's still going on because we're cooking you know, So something's happening. So there's molecules of grease floating through the air all the time. They're landing in the top of the clock room. So within, three, four, five months, that clock movement comes to a stop. Grease gets into gears, the, the ambient dirt opening the doors, the agrarian society, everybody's farming, you open the doors, wind blows in and the dirt attracts to the grease and it, the, the gears grind to a halt. So you would have had itinerant clock people, clock makers as they call them, coming around and cleaning your clock every four or five months. You can imagine how many times some of these clocks were cleaned. So I, I deal with some clocks that are 300 years old. I mean, just imagine the, the care. So when you see a clock, even these clocks, early 19th century, they, they've undergone maybe 20, 25 cleanings. If they've ran their entire life, you'll find some clocks that haven't ran, put it in, in Gammy's uh, office or in the attic somewhere, and it just didn't run for many years and somebody found it. So the itinerant clock maker would come around and clean clocks, Plus, he would also set the time with the more affluent group in neighborhoods, Philadelphia, um, Baltimore, New York City. So they come every week and they wind your clock, they lubricate your clock whenever there was an issue. And that actually stopped in the early 70s in Philadelphia, the last itinerant 
clock maker passed on. So I mean, what a what a long long run. But oh, obviously only for the affluent. And he may have up to, even in Philadelphia in the 18th century, 80 to 100 clients. So he spent all day going around. You know, but there were every obviously every day was staggered of winding clocks. So the problem in this little house is we are gaining all this oil that we don't want. We want clocks lubricated, but we don't want cooking oils and greases floating into the gears. So, and the other problem was we have rodents. We have a lot of rodents in here. So we needed cats. And that was one of the importation duties of cats. You know, we bring them over from England and everybody wanted a cat. So a cat was a good thing. But the problem with the cat is, and, and the significance of the clock, it was the most important thing in the house. It cost two to three times what this actual house cost to have that one tall clock. But if you were in any kind of business, an ag business, um, any kind of shipping and mercantile, you were so far ahead of everyone else if you were the first to have a clock in your region or your neighborhood. Because you just knew where to be, when you had to be there. Everybody else was just guessing. They had no idea what was going on. So you were ahead of the game and that you were really making money. So the clock was important. So we had issues. Grease in the air and cats. But we need the cats too. And we can't shut the grease down because we still want to eat. So the, uh, the thing is, the idea was back in 1670 is to case the clock. So we talked about a clock case. So we, let's case the clock. So they started with just a hood. So just this segment here, over that mechanism, and then the pendulum and the weights would hang down. They're still swinging. So that grease thing was taken care of fairly much. But the, clock, the, the cats are still batting it. So eventually, by 1700, you know, 1690s, um, we, we had a case, a very basic case, a uh, rectangular, almost coffin type case. And the coffin makers were the ones that were making clock cases back then. Uh, so by, I would say 1700, the cases became rather decorative. So in the beginning, they were just utilitarian. Let's keep the time moving so the clock doesn't stop. But then after 1700, right up until probably Victorian times or maybe 1900, clock cases followed decoration. You went through Chippendale, Queen Anne, William and Mary. So you went through all the stages in sequence. And, and some, some regions lag behind. And you would also have had in, in America and in England regional differences. You would have had, say, if they made clocks in Bordentown, it would have been a different style clock than they did in Burlington or Salem City. So just little tweaks here and there. New York City, Boston. So. So these decorative, and, and the same token as the furniture, everyone by 1725 liked to have a suite of furniture. So they wanted this, seemingly they wanted the same kind of wood, the same species of wood, and they wanted the same decoration on it. And uh, so it's, it's very interesting. And then probably by the 1800, the significance of the clock, because each, even a middle class family could have had two to three clocks in their house the importance of the time. If I didn't find it in this room, I could find it in another room. So therefore, the decorative art aspect, the furniture aspect of the clock overtook the horological aspect somewhere around 1800. So, um, so anyway, this guy was on its downturn in, in 1825. Its, its ornamentation is a little nail on the top, and it's pretty plain Jane. Um, so what, what happened is we started out with brass dials. And the brass dials, what we wanted is brass and the chapter ring is silver, and we'll see some of them coming up, um, because the silver would reflect the light of the candles best, and so would the brass. So we could have one candle in this room and have the clock somewhere 10 feet of it, and we could actually tell the time without hearing it. Um, but as clocks fell out of favor, you know, people got tired. It's the same thing with cars today. I tell people, I said, come on, there's been cars around since 18 or 1900, and and they do the same damn basic thing. They, they drive and they stop and you know, the windshield wiper, maybe not right back then, but I mean, nothing's changed. It's all these gadgets and gizmos everybody wants to, to play with with their hands today and feel like they're in some luxury mode of, you know, Park Avenue inside their car, this, this encasement. It's, it's crazy, it's crazy, it's crazy. You don't need this, this type of stuff. So, so, uh, so timekeeping started out as being very basic and very crude and uh, we started out with uh, more of a balance wheel, which a watch uses inside the clock for, for maintaining time. And it was very inaccurate in the 1650s, 1670s, and 80s. And somewhere around 1660, 1656, they, they're estimating a fellow named Huygens invented the pendulum. And that's what this guy has, and we'll show it to you in a minute, a long pendulum, it's a meter pendulum. 
and the king of England made the decree, and so they called it his royal pendulum. Mm. Okay, so then every time that pendulum swings back one way, it's one second to the center point, one way, one second, one second, and so that that is a royal pendulum, um, and just some odds and ends here. So when you have a mantle clock, and I think we have a mantle clock here, we have we have the Seth Thomas up there. I think it's a Seth Thomas. Um, that's shelf clock and mantle clock in American parlay, uh, but that pendulum goes very fast. So the shorter the pendulum, the faster it goes. If you've ever been to Monticello, Jefferson has this semi-tower clock, semi-domestic clock with an 11-foot pendulum. And it's very slow, very slow. Almost, you almost can't perceive it's going back and forth. It's so long, but very accurate though, very accurate. So. So we, we, we jump ahead, we have, the, we have our royal pendulum going on, we have fairly good accuracy, but it was a huge time jump from, say, 1756, um, or 1656, when this thing came in, the pendulum, you were losing in a typical clock like this anywhere from, say, five to 20 minutes a day. And if you weren't maintaining it, but the question is, how did you maintain that time then? You didn't, you didn't look at your pocket watch. There were pocket watches. Pocket watches were around before clocks were. Pocket watches go back to around 1600. Pocket watches, and they turned into a, a horizontal pocket watch called a table, a table clock or table watch. And it was for amusement. You could put it on your table when your friends came over and they, they'd watch the hands going around in 1650. And it was, it was a parlor game back then. Uh, so pocket watches evolved into the clocks. And the clocks, just as another note, started with the blacksmith's company, one of the guilds and or combination of the locksmith's company. That's where these things started. The oldest clock in the world is sitting in its Salisbury Cathedral in Salisbury, UK, and it's dating back to the 1440 or something like that. And it still works, it's been rest restored. They don't run it, but it can run on any given day. So um, crude ironwork, um, accurate to within two hours a day. But the question is, again, if your clock started losing time, how would you figure this out? So for sale back then, little wooden sundials that were at your local sundry store, if you could afford them, um, it would probably be a 10% the cost of one of these clocks. So you could sit it outside, sit on your windowsill. If you're lucky enough to have glass windows, maybe you didn't, because they're very expensive, but sit it outside, and you could get back in sync with the time and reset your clock. And a lot of this went on every day, this the resetting of time. And again, all this taken very, very seriously. So. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take the hood off, well, we're going to set this movement in, it's just on, undergone a restoration. So if you guys are at home, you want to have a good hand on the top and the bottom, because this is pretty tall. This is, uh, most of these clocks are made for under eight feet, even back in the day. And never hold on to those columns on the front because they're very fragile. So this guy is restored. Um, you know, when I got it, it it's, it's your clock. Uh, the brass was not this shiny. So a, a, a good clockmaker worth a, his grain and salt will know that he can tell if this clock has been clean in six years, 15 years, or maybe 20 years. 20 years to be the max. 20 years, it's gonna be a, almost a bronze look. So this guy is totally clean. And, uh, you know, so you have a hard time seeing this maybe, but let me you know. So you see these, these bright dots, they're the gears coming through that operate the, 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 main, the, main, uh, the main wheels at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So essentially, all these tall case clocks that are eight day, and eight day is a seven day wind. You wind it once a week, it'll run a little over, so they call it eight day. You have five gears up this side and five gears up that side. So one is your strike side and one is your chime side, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, this clock actually had, you can take a look at the cable, it actually had stainless steel cable. So somebody didn't quite know what they were doing on a conservation aspect, because this was relatively newly done, had stainless steel. So what it's doing, it has actually eaten grooves into this barrel. And even though this moves very, very slowly, it's visually almost imperceptible how slow the bottom large gears turn it still is grinding grooves in. And for me to replace a barrel, it's probably gonna run $2,500 to $3,500. Mm -hmm. 
and we don't want to do that. So we want to save our original fabric here, so we're using a conservation nylon. Um, it's going to last 100 years, it can hold 100 pounds of test, and that's where we want to be. So that's one of the issues. Here's where you're, if you can everybody see, this is, this is called a crutch. There's a, this 90 degree piece here mm -hmm. has a hole in it. That's where your pendulum goes up and attaches to the top. Okay? And this, going back and forth, is a second. A second here, a second there, a second here. And it only can go so far. But the great thing how these clocks were designed, they've designed this as one meter, this royal pendulum. And the mathematics is when it gets swinging, you have gravity pushing down, 9.8 meters a second. As it swings that way, the gravity's pushing down on the top of the pendulum bob, and it makes it go back. And it gets momentum and comes back, and it goes back and forth. And so the gravity. So the weight to your power, so we have two types of power. So I'm jumping all around here, but I'm just trying to give you a general background if anybody has any questions. So two types of power with any clock. Some tall clocks have springs. So you have springs or you have weights. And this guy has weights. Um, so the gravity maintains this. So, but we're not going to get too deep into how the clock works, but this is a clean clock. And the way to carry a clock is by the seat board. This is the board that sits on the two vertical uprights that you see there. Mm -hmm. I see people grabbing the dial. The dial is only attached by four posts. They're just riveted through the front. If you pick this up by the dial a few times, you're going to this mechanism and seat board are going to start to sag down. So if I'm holding it here, mm -hmm. then the rivets are going to, and somebody's done this, the rivets are starting to break through on the face, mm -hmm. here and here and here and here. And that's because they didn't know what they were doing. And you've got to get under here. It's just too much weight uh, to be out here. Is the dial wood? Oh, no, the dial's, the dial's uh, sheet steel. Okay. Sheet steel. And there was a, a big problem with the, the sheet steel. Um, All, the majority of these were made in Birmingham. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just touch a little bit on this. Um, and and I'm, I'm getting well versed in the apprenticeship system starting here around 1700. And the interesting thing is we didn't have an apprenticeship system here. Clocks, blacksmiths, didn't, didn't really happen. And, you know, like the American way, um, maybe the guy said, well, we'll try an apprenticeship system for seven years. And, he says, yeah, I think the kid knows enough. I'll just bring him on as an, as an employee and he will get off this apprentice and they'll, he'll have more responsibilities. So we didn't have a traditional system here. And the, the problem that happened here is you had people fleeing, you had the Quakers coming over and you had the, the quote, Pennsylvania Germans came into Pennsylvania, the Reading area. The Reading area is the biggest clock making center in all the colonies, all of them. They had three times as many clock makers in Reading in the 18th century as they did in Philadelphia. Uh, it was just a settlement, and they, they pumped them out, and they put them on the back, horseback and carts, and took them into Philadelphia, New York City, and Wilmington, and they sold them there. Um, Where were they from, those people in Reading? They were doing all this. They were near the Black Forest. Yeah. Oh. And they say religious prosecution, I don't believe it. Maybe some of them did. I think they were looking for the land of the free and, you know, you know money, money. Yeah. Uh, but the apprenticeship system, there were some inklings to have it set up here. So if you're, you were, you know, you're a clockmaker and say you came into Charleston, Charlestown as they called it back then, and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna set up a business here, you know? And the guy goes, and he sees that there's opportunity in being a farmer. He can make 10 times the money being a farmer and a clockmaker, and he, he kills himself all day as a forger, as a this and that, he's cutting out metal hands, and he can just, you know, he can have slaves down there doing his work for him. And if he can afford a couple acres of land, then he buys a couple more acres of land. So these apprenticeships never really took hold in America, particularly in the South, because the agrarian society was developing down there. And hence, you don't see clocks coming out of the South. You mm. see a couple Charleston makers, and you don't see furniture coming out. So all the cabinet makers. Um, but yet, don't forget, we had huge plantations in the South. So these big plantations, the plantation owner says, yeah, I want a couple tall case clocks in my house. I need some Chippendale furniture or Queen Anne furniture. So what did he do? He'd bring over, he'd bring over someone from England. He'd sponsor them to come over, bring them on. He says, you got 10 slaves to help you. So by the time the slaves learned everything, he shipped him back. He's out of the picture. And the plantation owners get the stuff made for free. High quality stuff. We don't know who those slaves were, 
whether it's clocks or furniture. And that was the standard fare of what was happening in the South. That's why the art and craft, the melding of the clockmaker and other allied type uh, um, artisans never really took hold. It took, took hold a little bit more in, uh, in the Northeast to make a product like this. But there's an easy way and there's a hard way to make clocks. So if you're a clockmaker in the 18th century and you have 25 to 35 years in your work span, you could probably turn out 50 clocks like this, 50 <coughs> clock movements. Remember, the cases were done by coffin makers. The more elaborate ones in Philadelphia and major cities were done by furniture makers. But basically, coffin makers, where they weren't burying somebody, they were building a clock case. Mm. So, um, so when was this one made? Uh, this is an English clock. Okay, so yeah. it came here from? Came here, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so they, they, they quickly found out, the clockmakers say, and we'll, we'll use this for Philadelphia for the rest of the talk, that uh, the hard way is, you know, 35 year career I have, I only make 50 clocks. I mean, it's, it's tough work, it's tough. I gotta I got do every process of this work. So what, what did they do? So somebody from the better person in Liverpool uh, in the UK came up and they said, well, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna, we're gonna start selling, uh, we're gonna start selling mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So they sold, mechanisms whole, they sold kits of mechanisms, and they sold just parts and components. So it's, it's good. So what would happen? Once a month, or once every six weeks, a horological, I'm okay with you, I'm, I'm good, I'm sorry. A horological supply ship would show up in all of the, the sea, sea towns, you know, Charleston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, New York. And just think, it hits Charleston first, so if everybody's buying a lot of goods and objects there, by the time it gets to Boston, they had slim pickings. But that's just how it was. And there would be people, clockmakers, so-called clockmakers, waiting, like a kid waits at the Best Buy for the next purple iPhone, <laughs> and his iPhone is perfectly fine, it's just in purple. So he puts a 10 out there and he waits like three weeks in advance and doesn't go to school. For, you know, and that's, it was the same thing. These people came out of the woodwork, you know, to, to go to Philadelphia waiting for the ship. They came from York, Lebanon County, Lancaster, Reading. And uh, so what do they get? They're buying dials, they're buying mechanisms, they're buying hands, they have all, they maybe five different type of sets of hands, styles, they have dials. They can put your name on it, right on the ship. So if you're willing to wait till tomorrow, you pay for it, you come back on the ship, you pick it up, you have your name, Lancaster PA, Philadelphia PA. And so this turned into a side job for them. So they were doing other things that people really needed, food, clothing, jobs, and these clockmakers, as other trades again, turned into side jobs doing this because somebody else was building it for them, somebody else was putting the name in there for them. There's all very few original builders of clocks doing it the hard way, the mm -hmm. hard way. So this is the easy way to make money. Um, <laughs> this particular one is made in uh, Birmingham, the sheet steel for the moon phase, the dial, and uh, it was also painted in the 18th century. I've seen <coughs> edges of women 24 to 48 in a line painting the same dial. Mm. One paints it white, you know, one <coughs> compasses the circles on it, the rings, and then the other starts on the, the, the numerals and things like that. Uh, these were originally done in ink, and when people say, well, it's getting kind of dirty from the fireplace, let me wash that off. And I, so that's when you see these things with no numbers and no uh, so we have one family that we know of in Philadelphia, and it's documented because you can look at this movement. We can pull the, the third gear on the strike side, which is over here, the middle gear out, and we can compare it with 20 clocks that I have. I can put that gear in and it fits and it runs. Amazing. Because it was based on the apprentice system, and the, the king formed a guild in, in 1656, and so you had these matching components that they were totally universal. So anywhere in England, anyone was, was building a clock, as long he was sanctioned by the king, had to adhere to the certain standards. And if you didn't, you were locked up for a couple of years, every offense, if they found you making clocks. And if they, if they found you making clocks illegally and you had your name on it, you could get life in, in prison. But by the blessing of the king, if you were part of this guild system, you could have your name on it. But we started somewhere around 1700, 1700 in England, actually painting different names on it. Like I just 
theoretically, we could say Thomas Chippendale. I'd say, oh, that's a, <coughs> that's a nice name, but it's, it's a furniture name, but I'm just saying, okay, put Thomas Chippendale. I'm sure a lot of people will buy it then, you know. And, you know, they, they put names on cars, ridiculous names on cars today. You know, you know, the Lincoln Navigator or whatever it is. Um, so anyway, people were making clocks for department stores, for clock sellers. So by 1700, you're seeing different names. So the name that's on there, you don't know if that's the guy that made it. It normally, I would say after 1725, is the guy that sold it, is the store that sold it. But they're, those people aren't telling you that. They're, they're, they're trying to tell you with, or they would take a person who's very popular in the day, very important, a very important clockmaker, and start forging his name on it and selling clocks at, at Macy's down the street. So, um, so anyway, so we're back to building these kind of clocks, the easy way, the hard way. So, you know, talk around town, everybody quickly knows, supply shift, easy way, we can make a lot of money. Uh, but the one that seems to be a breakaway is one of the more important, most important that we find in America is the Stretch family. Uh, the Stretch family of Philadelphia, Peter Stretch, he was the, the patriarch, and then he has son William and his grandson Thomas Stretch, and they, I think, went over 50, 55 years of clockmakers. And uh, various degrees of quality to the dials, but what, what was pretty consistent was the kind of movement they were doing. It was just not a movement attainable from England or from the supply ship. So they were doing it the hard way, but they, they were a much well-to-do family. They actually had a lot of indentured servants. Do you want to call them slaves? They could have been slaves. They're working in their shop. So maybe they were kind of making it kind of the easy way, maybe not the hard way totally, but it was somewhere in between. So they were getting free labor or some kind of crazy uh, situation going on the labor in their shops, which was very untraditional. But Peter Stretch came, he was a Quaker, and, and he really, he was a guy that really knew how to get himself into things. Uh, you know, just say like he was on the board of the hospital, the fire company being facetious again. But he got himself in situations where nobody was, going to, nobody was going to press him to say, hey, you got some indentured people working in your shop, but they didn't do that. So he was doing other things for society, so they kind of turned, you know, turned away from that. So, but anyway, so the Stretch family is the only one that's seemingly, uh, there's, there's a few others. There's one from New Jersey called Brokaw. Um, I would defy anyone to prove that he didn't make his own movements. So they were sketchy, but I mean, the guy must have starved, literally. Maybe he made 20 clock movements his entire life. And that's how difficult it would have been for him. So, uh, so the manufacturing process is very, very interesting. And they, they all, even if they were doing the, the mechanism, they said, well, we can still buy the dial off the ship. You know, we, we have the mechanism and we'll fit it up. We'll have a universal fit to go on here. And again, there were dial painters. They could put birds and sunshine or anything you wanted in the quadrants, put your face, and you could pay for it right there and it would be done for you. So uh, any questions about? Greg, on the back, you said you could tell how long it had been since the clock had been restored. Right. But how many years was it for this one before you restored it? <clears throat> well, I, I think we thought we had it restored here a couple years ago. The problem, the problem we have today, to me, this is an important cultural historic artifact. And to clean this properly, this is done by hand. So this is put in a, in a, in a solution with no ammoniation, so no ammonia. Ammonia will break down brass. So how does it break down brass? Brass is, a component of brass is lead. So the ammonia goes in the pores of the brass, which we can't even see, and it starts deteriorating the lead. So it's like if you had a flat board and put it outside at rain, the mark's not gonna be flat. So when you put this ammonia in solution, these two plates, these two side plates here, these two guys where all the gears are between, you put it in the ammonia, take it out, they're gonna be like, a little bit like a potato chip. Not, not that bad, I'm, I'm exaggerating. But you have, these, you have these arbors or axles going through, and if this thing's a little bit cockeyed or bent, it's gonna bind, the clock's not gonna run. Two human hairs in between these teeth will mm -hmm. stop this clock, two mm -hmm. human hairs together. So that's how you know, specific it is. So the cleaning, the cleaning aspect, so when I looked at this clock, I could tell you this clock hasn't been cleaned in maybe six years prior when I got it. But what I'm saying is, there's no regulation of clockmakers. Um, there's a lot more regulation of watchmakers, so who's doing that? Well, we have the big, the big one is, say, Rolex. Rolex trains people, okay? So 
so they train people to a very high standard. If you don't get to the high standard in their school, they give you the school for free, but if, if you think you're gonna go out and work for yourself, they'll never, never sell you a Rolex part, so you're screwed. So if, they'll put you through school for two years, but you have to work so many years for Rolex, six or eight years, and an authorized Rolex dealer. So they got you, but it's, it's providing really good training. Our clock makers today, for cleaning clocks and fixing clocks, there's no standards, there's no nothing. So I do, I've done volunteer work, I've taught classes at the National Watch and Clock Museum in Columbia, PA, going on 20 years now. Um, I, I was an advocate for trying to get standards for people. So what do they do? So if you, anybody here wants to be a member, you could call them up and say, well, for 45 bucks you're a member, you get a, three magazines a year, and you, you, you feel important. They give you a number, your number 1365. Okay, but guys would use this, the guy down the street used this, he puts on his business card, an NAWCC member number 1365, well what's that mean? You just, you paid your 45 bucks. That doesn't mean you're at a standard that you could, you, to restore clock records. Not only, you guys know what a Howard Miller is, you know, one of these 30 year old clocks with the glass doors and the brass, bright brass weights. I mean, they don't even clean those anymore. So I'm saying the standard of who's doing the clock. So this clock could have gone to somebody who just, he could spray something on it, he could do a multitude of things, but it was never cleaned properly by hand. So that's the problem, that's the problem, no standards. And there's a lot of jury rigging we can do with these clocks just to make them work. Make them work for two or three years, and you're gonna call me back again. You're gonna try this over. Say, sir, it's an old clock, it just keeps falling apart, the metal's collapsing. I mean, you could say all kinds of things, and that's what they do. But even for the new Howard, this is a very, uh, very basic movement. It's, it's not sophisticated. I mean, a, a, literally a, a six, seven-year-old could probably take it apart and put it back together. That doesn't mean he can do the fixes right now, but he can, he can probably put the puzzle pieces back together. But if you get a Howard Miller in one of these department store clocks, They've taken this clock and they've turned it upside down. It's a sophistication. It's beyond belief. And, and you know, it's Westminster Chimes playing on the quarters. But to take those clocks apart and put them back together takes four to five times what it does to this one. So it's crazy. So these people that are not trained are not going to touch a Howard Miller clock. But there's money to be made there because they can go one of two suppliers and they can order me a Howard Miller clock. It's a Hermely movement, number 3150. So 3150 comes in at $295. The guy tells the client that, oh yeah, I serviced your clock. It's all clean. Look, it's bright and shiny new. He bought a new movement for 275. He charged the client $800, $900. And it took him five minutes to put it in. <laughs> and it's a standard lie that goes around the whole clock industry. And then there's a bigger lie going back to clock cleaning. I mean, we got deviated here, I'm sorry. You, you, there's a point you go, you know too much about too much stuff. I mean, seriously. <laughs> So there's, there's two companies out there on the, on the Mid-Atlantic states, and they say, well, come to your house and clean your clock for you. We'll service your clock. So they come, they got a truck, 55 gallon drums of acetone, pull the dial, take it off the seaport, take the movement, just dunk it in. Mm -hmm. There's an agitator with a generator on the back. And what it does, it does, where the axles go through the plates is where the oil is dry. People make the mistake, they don't call every three, five years. If you let it dry, oil, into a breach, it'll stop the clock. You can't rehydrate it. So these guys put in the back and they, you know, they, they get 50% of the grease. It's not just grease. So when your clock runs out of oil, the oil dries up and the same with your car. If the car wasn't floating in oil. These clocks just have a little oil in the tip of those axles. If you let it dry and it's running dry, this clock may continue to run with no oil. The problem is, is, and people say, oh, but it's still been, it's been running for 18 years, I haven't serviced it. Oh, you idiot. Well, you know what you're doing. You're taking a round hole with a round axle <laughs> with a millimeter of play, and you're, you're steel to brass. So that hole becomes ovoid, because, and he's, he's proud to think that he's saving money that he didn't have his clock service. So it becomes an ovoid hole. So is this guy gonna stay here? Yeah. So, so you have, a, you have as each gear meets with the next gear, it's a pinion it meets with. And as they turn in, what happens is, as that hole is ovoid, this gear starts dropping down like this. Mm -hmm. And as it starts turning, it's not getting the right mating 
per ear like this. So it's, it's binding on the tips. So eventually it starts breaking tips off the teeth. And there's a point of no return and say, well, hell, you're missing, you know, you're missing 160 teeth. It's gonna cost you like, you know, $75 a tooth put back. This clock is a good time. And here he was, he was all happy because he's saving, you know, four or five or six or seven hundred dollars every every 14 years or so. And traditionally, you have to oil, after five and a half years, the oil dries out totally. It's done. So we tell everybody, you give me a call every five years. I've done 350 clocks this year, or in 2022. I'm not gonna call you, and if I, I'm not gonna play phone tag with you 10 times for one person. I would have to call 350 people and say, maybe 350 people from five years ago and say, it's time to get your clocks off. And, you know, so I'm waiting for the people to tell me, and they generally forget, and then you have another service problem. So it's causing them a lot more extra cash to keep their clocks running, because there's too many other priorities for people today than maintaining their histor historical cultural Basically. Some people are great about it. There's just a handful, two or three percent. So, yeah, right. so anyway, that's how that's how you know by the the color of the brass. I know it was not properly cleaned. Uh, the Howard Millers of the world, those kind of movements, the Hurley movements, they can go in an ammoniated solution. Those components of those clocks are rolled brass. They're they're work hardened brass. Where this is cast, the plates and the gears are so. This is four times softer than those new mechanisms that are out there. Mm. So, anybody else have any questions on that? Did you do the face? Did you clean it or restore that at all? Um, just touched a little bit in here, but okay. it gets it gets real iffy. I mean, in a face alone to clean this face, if we're going to do it right up in the globes, <clears throat> this, these are phenomenal globes that somebody's cleaned a lot of it off, but. There's a point where you have to clean it off, mm -hmm. photograph it today, and then re-ink it. Re-ink it with a pen. Oh, wow. And, you know, so you could be talking about a twelve to fifteen, sixteen hundred dollar job to restore the style properly. Just the moon wheel is going to be four to four fifty, and this guy is falling apart. Mm -hmm. So what I was getting at is here, they, um, they started to use some type of galvanization in the early 18th or 19th century, and the paint just doesn't adhere to the moon wheels for some reason. So it's a different grade steel than they were using for the main pans. So we see moon wheels coming in all the time. Uh, this can be salvaged a little bit, but you know it's still going to be a four or five hundred dollar job to do the moon wheel. Yeah, but it'll keep going, and eventually there'll be no pain on this, and you'll have no idea what, what was there. Yeah. Did you? So, yeah. Did you have to drill any uh, of the uh, the axle holes or the for push for bushings in there? Yeah, this, this needed, I, I'd have to look at the paper. This needed okay. a few bushings. That's an yeah. indication. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's saying the last guy that looked at this, you know, when he, he should mm -hmm. test in a gear, he should test the slot in the gear. Mm -hmm. So by taking this, you need side shake. You need shake back and forth so it doesn't bind, mm -hmm. but there's no lift up and down. So that's basically a millimeter. Mm -hmm. There can only be a millimeter of play on some of these. Mm -hmm. so. A millimeter, please? A mil millimeter of play. 40,000 of Yeah, that's the play you have between the axle and oh, okay. the hole exactly. in the plate. Yeah, okay. that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And you never oil the gears because that's going to be an attractant for ambient dirt. And then you'll create a grinding paste going around and you'll actually literally wear down the teeth and the fingers. So, uh, so it doesn't work. And, and the last guy, too, and we're not, I don't even know who he is, I don't, don't, know, don't want to know who he is, but uh, he had put these on there or they were on there, they should have been removed. These are for uh, the Seth Thomas mantle clock. These are wooden pulleys. And, uh, you know, with this, this kind of weight that's on this clock, these are 14 to 18 pound weights each. It's, it's wore a heavy groove in here. So imagine that heavy groove of the cable worn in here eventually. Say the beginning was working really well, but then it started to wear the groove. Now, as it's getting caught in the groove, it's creating additional friction. And that's another reason the clock wasn't running properly. So, you know, these are for Steve. He can put these <laughs> on, on his pier of his Porsche. Uh, <laughs> I'll give to Bonnie for earrings. Earrings. Okay, Bonnie for earrings. So then we went to the, uh, you know, a traditional replacement or restoration um, pulley. So, yeah, that's what it should be. And even these pulleys, that, that bearing surface and that turns, that wears out. So you have to check those also. So. Uh, these are these are hardened. These are work hardened, uh, not copies of the original because these really break down quick. 
And this is a place where a lot of clock makers don't work too hard to find the problem. So. But uh, traditionally, this guy just sits, in, just sits in there. It just sits on top. So we're just going to place it up there. So whenever, if, you, if you're doing this at home, beware that sometimes you have a very heavy dial. It's actually the poster longer is sitting in front. And I've seen people try to start to do the clock and they turn away and the clock falls. Mm -hmm. So, but this guy's really playing it well. So we, uh, we have a, our pendulum assembly. So we have a rod, we have a steel rod. This is original to that clock. And this is a brass bob. This is lead in the back. And they took very thin sheet brass and they so nicely, literally pounded that brass over the circumference. It is spotless, seamless. So he was a master. So this was done, bobs were made by somebody else in England, in Liverpool. The rod was made. At one point, there was 29 different trades in Liverpool to make a clock movement. Mm. So in the back, this is an adjustment. So we have a square going through here, and this is called a rating nut. So again, if we're talking about Jefferson's 11-foot pendulum at Monticello, um, if we elongate this, we slow your clock down. If we turn the nut one way, it moves up, and we speed the clock up. So season to season with these kinds of clocks, you will have a variant of time. <coughs> So every time you get out of the heating season in April or so, you should be adjusting the time of your clock if it bothers you. A lot of people don't care, you just move the hands back, stop the clock, let time catch up and things like that. So uh, and we try to keep, we try to keep, we try to bend this when I put it on permanently, keep this guy straight. So we come up here and we saw that, that 90 degree piece on the movement. That's, this, this block is in between. And this is your suspension spring and this will hang and this spring has a little whip to it, and it's, very, it's hard as steel, and it'll whip it back. So when the, when the gravity pushes this side, it's really freewheeling free with very little uh, torsional friction here in, in the spring. So, but these are very fragile. I tend to break these sometimes. I'm putting this box in the car, and I, I hit it. And I, if you just go too far, it'll, it's so hard that it'll snap. And then it's, it's a bugger. I mean, it's, it's an hour job to cut another one and to, take the block and take the top holder off and so it's a big deal so you got to be very careful with that so uh, and that's how you set your time with the clock so you time the clock out i'm not going to put this on right now because i'm we're doing what we're doing here uh, but we will by the end of the end of our the clock to put it back up and uh you know why we're on the movement here so the interesting thing is and, and i'm sure how to put it that that clock movement, just say this, this isn't a bracket clock mechanism. This is shot. This is about 50 years old. Wasn't taken care of. Um, it should be bright brass. Um, it has so many worn areas. So what someone had done with this is spray with WD-40. You know, just a, a cheap lubricant. <coughs> and WD-40 is great in the beginning. So, and a lot of clock makers do that too. They'll come into your house and say, ma'am, you may smell something. And they get the, uh, you know, they get the, the can, they spray it, and it stinks for a while. And, and the clock may loosen up, it may not. The problem is, after about six months, that WD-40 congeals. It just shrinks down and becomes a sludge, just like the grease. So it gives you a, sh and there's no guarantee for your clock, man, because it's an old clock. If I can get it going, here's your bill, and that's that's how they handle it. So, um, but what I want to say, so. If we think of, of clock time, I mean, we can't, we can't describe what time is. I mean, we're all closer to being dead since I've been standing there, seriously. And it just, it just, it just keeps moving, and then when it grabs it, stops. And listen, can we, can, we, can we stop time for a little bit and think about this, and maybe think about how we can better spend our time? We can't, it just keeps going. So the whole essence of this mechanism, this machine, that machine and all these clocks we're talking about is to be able to count a second. So if we can count a second, we can count a minute and count an hour. So that's the whole premise of all these gears and all these interlocking wheels and levers. And you know, and there, someone said that this movement, every every hour, it's like sixty thousand different 
gears hitting pinions, things brushing, it's 60,000 in this little thing alone, hitting each other. It's crazy. I mean, you have the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the second wheel at the top is going around 60 times a minute, so just start thinking about that. It's, it's quite interesting. So the whole, the guts of this guy, how do we get to the hands? All this gearing and levers on the front is all about telling you the time on the dial. So these are the motion works it's called, and, and all this conglomeration on the front of this plate is all about transferring that second by second information that this guy is doing for us and putting it to two hands. That's all it does. And some clock makers, some companies were better doing it than others. Like, this is great, this is not. Super sophisticated to take apart. This takes me a couple hours to put back together. I don't like it because it's a cheap thing. It's made, it's made in 1970. I, you know, I don't have anything to do with this. I don't like to deal with anything quite past 1850. That's my cutoff date for antiquity. Uh, otherwise, everything was mass produced. And this, so you have two types of time regulation. This guy is the pendulum, okay? The pendulum, that's your regulator, second by second. So if we turn the nut, we can speed it up, we can make it go a second and a quarter, or we can slow it down and make it go three quarters of a second back and forth. We can do that, but we're trying to get a second. So we're trying to find the sweet spot of moving that bob on that pendulum. This doesn't operate on the pendulum. This is a, a mantle clock. That thing going back and forth is called a balance, a balance wheel. That's how watches work. So that you, I mean, if this clock was running, man, I could have it upside down any way, and it continues to run, the wheel continues to run, and that's what a watch does. So there's a balance spring and a balance wheel. But they're very fragile, they're very flighty. And that's where, uh, to do a mechanism like this, if there's a problem with the balance wheel here, I mean, this moving is shot again, but this is the, that melding of a clockmaker watchmaker. Most watchmakers don't do clocks and vice versa. I mean, if you like doing small stuff under magnification, it's one thing, or you like doing big stuff. So then I have colleagues in the field, like we're gonna look at this, this tower clock. They like doing huge tower clocks, and they wouldn't even conceive of doing something this size or that size, let alone a watch. So you have all these segmentations. Some people only do um, cuckoo clocks. 90% of the clock makers stay away from cuckoo clocks. You know, they just think they're garbage, they're garbage. You know, I mean, they say they're, they're, they're garbage from the standpoint it's a good little movement inside, but they're operating on a whole series of levers, just wires, maybe about 10 wires in there. And you've got to play with them, putting them back together, make sure that wire is a little longer, that's bent a little this way. And, and the problem is the lady's going to say, well, it's only worth 65 bucks, you're charging me 360 to fix it. Well, then, you know, so there's always this, how much do you charge for this stuff? And say, look, lady, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Just hang it on the wall and look at it. I know it was grandma's, but look at it. But then some people say, okay, whatever cost, it's sentimental. So 90% of what I do, I would say, is sentimental. Every, every, it's, it's in the family. And partic particularly today, we had the discussion earlier of the values of clocks like this have plummeted to zero. Not zero. This, this clock is worth $1,000, $900 maybe today. It's, and you go back um, 10, 12 years. This is a $3,500 clock. Mm -hmm. So, quote, younger people, I know no one that's over 50 here, but um, younger people don't want this old stuff. And it only takes two people at auction to tango. And if you don't have two people, if that clock went to auction, then it goes for nothing. So, it's very sad. Very sad. And then you see the advent of, uh, on your social media, free this, $10 for that, you know. And, uh, I, have, I have clients that I've done furniture in their house this one fellow, I mean, to find a five drawer Philadelphia chest, Israel Sack used to say, 32 inches wide, 32 high, quarter columns, perfect proportions. Those, those things were selling for eighteen to $20,000 25 years ago. You can buy them now for $1,900 to $2,200, $2,300. This guy has one in his garage. He's throwing craftsman tools in it. He's just like, he's been working on his car, he throws the tools, the drawers open, seriously. Yeah, well, I bought that, I thought I'd one day I'd refinish it and take it in the house. I said, I'll give you 2000 for it right now, but you know, I didn't want to sell it, so. It's crazy, it's crazy, so. But that's, that's where we are, we, we talked the last session about antiquity, so. Um, any questions or about clock movements, setting them up, or um, lubrication is every five years? <laughs> this is long. So I think, so we'll, we'll talk about this uh, video quickly here. 
uh, again, uh, started this, I had inspiration. I was, I, was getting, I was doing a fellowship at the National Watch and Clock Museum uh, eight or nine years ago, and uh, my mother called me, it was a lunch, and she said, oh, there's, you know, that's out in near York and Columbia, PA, and she said, oh, in the Salem paper, there's something about a clock in Salem that's a very old clock, and they can't find people to fix it. So anyway, long story short, I eventually got involved another six to eight years later. And it's, it's owned by the First Baptist Church in Salem. It's kind of, it was quasi-owned by Salem City and the church. <clears throat> At that time of the article, probably going back to 9 or 09 or 10, Salem City put out a proclamation saying, we don't want, we don't want that tower clock anymore. We don't want the town clock. We, because it's sitting in, in the Baptist church, because it's going to be caught, you know, for somewhere on a religious situation. We just don't want to go. Now, Salem City is, you know, 20, $27 million in the red. They only have 1,900 people that live there today. The $27 million in bankruptcy right? And the state's running Salem City. So, and the actual fact that this clock, Salem City, since 1901, has not paid anybody to put a drop of oil in this mechanism. It is ran, ran, and ran. And it's ran to nothing. I mean, you talk about the holes where the axles are going through, you could like drive a car through them. And that's how bad it is. And then you have people that would go up and say, hey, I'll, I'll take care of the clock. He goes up the chicken ladder. He sprays it with WD-40. <laughs> now, up there, you have open vents. The air is like, you know, you're, you're 170 feet up, and the air is blowing through, and it's encased in dirt. And you hear the gears grinding and grinding as it's clock. So I stopped the clock in, I think it was around 17, 2017, I stopped it. Um, so I, I had intentions of uh, intentions of really fixing it, and, and I was going to volunteer to fix it. So I did some research, and it is the oldest town clock in in, in America. It's old, 1702. Uh, and you'll see uh, you'll see by the handout there that there was a couple fires. It was moved a couple times. And the last time, a Baptist church says, "Oh, we have land up in the center of town." It was way outside of town, so people couldn't hear it. And this was around 1850. So they moved it and they built a tower and they put it up in the tower, hence tower clock, it's a tower clock mechanism. So what happened was that the First Baptist Church, the next year, their church burned down from outside of town. And they says, hey, mayor and city council, we want to move in town. We're going to build our church around the tower and that'll be our clock and our bell and it'll be the towns. You know, we'll have a handshake, you maintain it, we'll maintain it. Town says, oh, that sounds good to us. You guys can handle it then. And that's what happened. So, um, so is it running? Oh no, I, 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 I terminated at seventeen because it was just grinding. Okay. And you say it's the oldest clock in America, and yet the movement has been replaced four times. The oldest the, it was it was the oldest the oldest bell. Let's put it that way. The oldest bell. The oldest bell. That's different from the and, oldest clock. Yeah, yeah. And and so the components the components from the bell leading up to the clock are still original. So it's more than we can say about any other clock in America <laughs> by a long shot. By long shot. And the stretches made the town clock in Independence Hall. But wow. that was destroyed. Um, it went in disrepair, and then somebody replaced it in the 70s for the bicentennial. So we don't even have that one. They didn't even keep it. That's how much engaged they were with, with history even in the 1970s. So we have a we have a bell that in the casting was in northern New Jersey, and they're still in business. Two people in the family still there. 1702. And there's four different castings. So every time it burned, I think three times, it fell to the ground, the bell cracked, the movement was shot. And this last movement was by Seth Thomas, the grandson came down. He measured it, made it, and that's the movements in there now. So we, we had some money, monies that were given, donated when I put this video out. And probably thought it's gonna be 150,000 to do it. Uh, because everything has to go up a chicken ladder. So we're going up 100 feet of chicken ladder. Crazy, absolutely crazy. So we had a, a lady came, called me up. She says, "Oh, my mother passed away uh, a couple weeks ago." And she said, "I know it's a big girl. She's watched your videos, you know, and she was near 100." And she said, "She's going to give you 150 thousand dollars." I said, "Oh, don't give it to me. Give it to the the church." So the church had set up a, a, a fund with the pastor that was there, and uh, you know, I turned her over to him, and I was waiting to hear because I'm looking for money for supplies. I estimate twenty-five to thirty thousand in supplies, at least. 
And plus I need ancillary people. I need some electricians, I need a couple carpenters. We need to re, uh, make a new base for this clock, uh, some glass professionals and things like this. So I waited and waited a year and I'm, I'm busy. I'm doing what I'm doing, you know? And I finally went over there and I went to the guy's house. He's not there. His car's there and he's not there. And talk, Sunday morning I show up at the church and the church isn't cooking, but they have a soup kitchen in the back. So I go around back and, and I'm asking if this person goes to the church and she says, well, the pastor absconded with the money. He took the money. So he, would, he told this lady, he said, I want, you write, just write the check to me and I'll, I'll take care of it. And he did, he took care of it. <laughs> and, and so he's, he, he was an interim pastor. He was kind of a quasi-pastor. And so for the three years he was there, you know, we have, we have very generous people say, look, I'm in a wheelchair, I can't get to church. I feel so guilty, I want to give you some money. So how about if I write you a check for a thousand a month? And you had several people down there doing that. So they're writing the check to him. So he, he took off with the money. So. Uh, they found him. I don't know what it's not in my hands, but the FBI found him, I think. So. I have no idea. So he was he was he was fronting, he was a sex therapist in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Man. Seriously, that's the story. And he was he was doing a, his pastorship there. So terrible. So anyway, it's sat vacant now since uh, six, seven years. It's been mm. Signs still out there, and I think nobody wants to uh, really pick it up. I think the church, um, the church is somewhat flush. They probably have a million dollars if they wanted to spend a hundred thousand dollars, one fifty. But they, because they only have a congregation of maybe ten people, eight, ten people on a Sunday, there's no motivation even to spend any money on this. But it's very sad. Yeah, very sad. So anyway, so we'll take a look at this, and if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, the term lights down, Steve. Greg, are you saying in this that we can write you $150,000 check? Oh, no. Take care of it I'll take care of you guys right now. We'll have a collection for you. Leave something for Steve for this program. Okay.